Futures higher after tepid PCE data locks in a September rate cut 30 minutes until the start of trading. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Shanali Basic. Matt Miller is off today, and Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Coming up, marching on. Stocks close in on a fourth month of gains as latest inflation data reinforces bet that the Fed will start cutting in September. Meanwhile, Intel explores its options. The chipmaker is said to be working with investment bankers to help navigate the most difficult period in its 56-year history. And shares of Lululemon bouncing back despite a sales slowdown. Increased competition and relentless inflation curb demand for its pricey yoga pants. Meanwhile, let's take a look at where markets are trading 30 minutes until the cash open on this Friday, the end of what's been a volatile week and a volatile month. You take a look at where we stand right now. Quiet so far, the S&P 500 up about three tenths of a percent pre-market, a little bit more so if you take a look at the NASDAQ 100. Of course, we were higher for a lot of yesterday despite NVIDIA's drawdown. Then we closed lower, now we're higher again. A lot of volatility. Meanwhile, you look for stability and you find it in the bond market right now. 10-year Treasury yields currently higher by about one basis point, Chinali. Looking at some pre-market movers on our radar. Intel, as you've been talking about, now higher after Bloomberg News reported that the company is weighing options that include a split of multiple businesses and Intel up pre-market about 6.5%. We will talk more about that stock throughout this hour. Lululemon shares higher despite reducing its full-year forecast. Morgan Stanley sees the revised guidance as achievable. Lulu now up about 3.8% pre-market. And investors are not being so kind to Ulta Beauty, which trimmed its sales forecast following weaker-than-expected second-quarter results. Ulta really down a lot this morning, so almost 7% pre-market, Katie. So you have that dispersion underneath the hood of the index. But if you meditate on the indexes for a little bit, I think yesterday was actually pretty important and pretty interesting because, of course, when this show was on, we were talking about the resiliency of the S&P 500, even though you had those NVIDIA losses. By the end of the day, of course, those gains weren't able to hold, but still be close exactly flat. It seems like this market maybe is starting to move past it's just about NVIDIA, it's just about big tech. But is that broadening story enough to move that market higher? At the same time, you did see August be a positive month, but you did see a lot of carnage across the street, pods of certain hedge funds closing uh, with less investors and less leverage. Let's see how high we can go, Katie. Well, maybe the Fed will save us. And of course, we did get some inflation data this morning, which would suggest it's the case. And here to break that inflation data down, Michael McKee, Bloomberg's chief international economics and policy correspondent. At the end of the day, you looked at that PCE data. What did it mean in terms of expectations for how much that the Fed might cut in September? It looks like that hope of a 50 basis point cut is less realistic these days. Well, it's less realistic, but the, the question is what, what happens next week with jobs? Because that's now going to be dispositive. We see inflation is continuing to go away comes in as anticipated for the PCE numbers both the headline and the core up two tenths of a percent the core on a year-over-year -year basis comes in up 2.6 percent that's lower than had been anticipated incomes up three tenths and wages and salaries are up three tenths uh, just a little bit more than last month still raises the question of how do people keep spending half a percent uh, per month. Does that continue? It does say soft landing in terms of the overall numbers. On a three-month average basis, though, we are seeing PCE fall and continue to fall, and the Fed is now not as Jay Powell said last week, not really going to worry about an outbreak of inflation again. The one thing you have to wonder about with all these numbers is the savings rate falls to 2.9 percent. First time in the twos since 2002, and that was only one month. Before that, to see a continual two point something savings rate, you have to go back to 2008. So are we seeing people run out of money? Will the soft landing continue? What are people going to be spending when it comes to the fall and the holiday season? That's what we don't know. And let's take this conversation to Wall Street because one of our producers, Dan Curtis, points out that you take a look at the trading right now, sort of a tepid reaction to today's PCE figures. There was more trading around initial jobless claims yesterday, around GDP yesterday. And it feels like the focus for markets and for the Fed has really shifted 
to growth, to the labor market. It seems like inflation now, we're content to say that beast has been slayed. Well, the Fed has been saying, and Jay Powell emphasized this last week, that the balance of risks has tilted a little bit towards the labor market now. Less so inflation. Inflation is behaving the way they expect it to. PCE is a number that is comprised of a lot of data that comes out of the uh, producer price index and the consumer price index. So economists are pretty good at putting all that together and forecasting it. So you had that basically priced in today. There was no surprise. The, uh, all the numbers came in pretty much as expected. So now we turn to numbers we don't know. And that is the labor market numbers. We'll see jobless claims, jolts, ADP, and of course, non-farm payrolls next week. All right. There's always something to worry about. Mike McKee, really appreciate your time. Great to see you and happy Friday. Happy Friday. Let's bring this conversation over to Ethan Devitt. She is Chief Investment Officer over at London CIV. And I want to talk to you about your personal balance of risks. Obviously, it seems like for much of the street and for the Fed itself, more focus now on the state of the economy, about growth in this economy, and of course the health of the labor market, rather than just inflation. Where are you viewing the most risk right now? It's interesting. Sitting here in London, we are really the exception that proves the rule a little bit with some of those indicators you've cited. The Bank of England has not seen enough comfort in the inflation numbers. They're probably not going to cut in September. They'll wait till November. That, of course, has had the inverse effect on sterling as to what's currently happening with the dollar. Sterling is close to a two-year high versus the dollar. And we are seeing sluggish economic growth here out of the UK, but we still don't think inflation has been slayed. So it's really the inverse. So I'd say what are we worried about is that maybe that could be a canary in the coal mine for the US. Is it the case that inflation really has been slayed or is it so lagging that we, we can't tell? Your colleague mentioned the focus on employment numbers. We had that massive revision in US employment numbers to the tune of over 800,000 that barely got a recognition in markets, although it was discussed by quite a lot of commentators. So do we really know what's going on with unemployment and employment numbers? Do we really know what the effect uh, of the immigration and um, the, the body of immigrants is on those numbers? Are they real and can they be compared? So I'd say there's still a lot of murkiness in the data, but clearly the Fed now, the expectations are built in for even a 50 basis point rate cut, it seems as consensus. The markets will be pricing that for perfection. Well, even if you're still worried about inflation and you add that on top of all the other risks out there, I mean, how does that change how you invest in this market? Obviously, it seems like a lot of people are just happy to price in Fed rate cuts uh, to a great extent. Where do you fall on that? Well, rate cuts have that complex effect on what we have as a strong component of any portfolio, which is real assets. So real assets have always been the inflation resilient piece of a portfolio. And when we do see rate cuts coming, that, of course, boosts real assets such as real estate, particularly residential real estate. It just loosens up some of the investors to invest in other real assets because it lowers the bar, essentially. The bar for real assets is what could you make on a risk-free bond. So if that's coming down, that then frees up capital to go elsewhere into bond substitutes such as dividend-paying equities. We've already seen that and then income yielding investments such as infrastructure, real estate, real assets such as forestry even. So I think that actually there's a, we're quite used to some inflation in a portfolio and that's how we would best invest accordingly. At the end of the day, I do feel like a broken record even for constantly asking about this, but the consumer story is becoming increasingly complicated with rates at this level and from feeling the pinch of yes, inflation moderating, however, prices being much higher than they were years ago. You see it in some of the earnings reports already, and market is on tender hooks here when you think about the jobs report next week. Where do you think most of the pain will continue to come from, from the consumer sector that may not be priced in right now? We're going to see discretionary spending coming down. And you rightly pointed out earlier that we are looking at this big question mark around retail sales around the holidays, because that's when the biggest ticket items would come. We've seen reasonably steady demand, and that's been surprising. But where are we hearing about um, demand fluctuations? But well, areas like, say, Airbnb, we're hearing about that. We're also looking at some of the demand projections coming out of the earnings picture. Not all of them looking so rosy. Yes, the savings rate is lower, but maybe the savings level is still high post-COVID. The savings rate's lower because the consumer is being squeezed. We know they're paying more oh, and cumulatively for what, what they're, um, they're purchasing. And also that if they do want to buy a house, for example, mortgage rates are a lot higher. 
So the, in, the consumer definitely is under some pressure and we hear that from all of the company reports. What's boosting companies right now is the fact that they've been able to cut costs, they're being rewarded for that, and that is shoring up margins. So we will all hear about this now as the election progresses in the US. The economy is going to be the biggest issue of this election, and how it's faring is going to be under the microscope. Even where does the housing market in particular matter most? Uh, uh, buying a home, paying your rent is a big part of a consumer's pocketbook right now, a big part of their wallet. And at the end of the day, even if you have mortgage rates coming down, 6.5% or near 6.5% is still a long way to go from that sub 4% that many consumers are still sitting with at their current homes. People are not getting out of their homes at a 6.5% interest rate. We're seeing that sluggishness still. So we're where does that have a ripple effect across markets? Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that no matter what happens in terms of demand and supply, and we do think with mortgage rates coming down, that's going to unlock some of the frozenness really of the, the housing market, that there will be more sellers coming to market, more buyers able to come to market. But equally, if mortgage rates come down, that then gives a boost for sellers to keep their prices high. And we've seen that prices are continuing to rise month on month, there has been no let up on that. So the affordability issue on average is a problem. Of course, different areas of the country treated differently. But remember, there is that mortgage and interest, the, the tax deduction there for that. So that could be something that many residents have missed out on because they've been forced to rent while they've been waiting to buy a home. So definitely affordability is a problem. It's not nearly as much a problem in the US as it is in parts of Europe though. Yeah, that's good context, global context, since we spend so much time talking about the U.S. housing market. And I want to switch gears here because, of course, we're talking about the Fed uh, and tech has been the story of the week. But another news item that crossed this week, of course, was Berkshire Hathaway crossing $1 trillion in market valuation, I believe the first non-tech company to do so. And Ethan, I'm just curious how you received that news because I feel like an optimist could extrapolate that out as maybe some hope for the value investor. Exactly. Well, the classic get rich slow story, looking at company fundamentals, companies that have moats, that has been the Warren Buffett mantra for, for decades now. I think he just turned 94. So clearly a going strong in terms of that mantra working. But then we just looked at Ulta numbers. He bought, took a stake in Ulta recently, and the Midas touch maybe will be a slow burn as opposed to something that we see immediately reflected in that company's stock price. So clearly the, the oracle of Omaha is, is very much under um, scrutiny of everything he does, whether it's selling down Bank of America, selling down Apple or buying into Ulta. It's seen as an indicator of perhaps good value, as you pointed out, or, or just a, a strong fundamentals on part of a company. So as we see this um, evolving, and clearly there is a belief in this rotation, in value stocks, in bond substitutes, as I mentioned, I do believe that we're going to see an encouraging depth and breadth being built into markets. Absolutely fascinating. Ulta down, Berkshire still up pre-market above that $1 trillion level value, perhaps of diversification. Ethan, we thank you so much. Ethan Devitt is Chief Investment Officer at London CIV. A quick check here on futures, because as we've been talking about volatile intraday trading here, but we are starting today in the green. S&P futures up almost four tenths of 1%. NASDAQ 100 futures up about eight tenths of 1%. Russell 2000 getting a bid as well. Well, about four times of 1%, Katie. And we'll see if we can hold on to those gains. We'll keep an eye on that. And we're also keeping an eye on Intel as Bloomberg News reports that it's working with investment bankers to help navigate through a historic slump. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. And now to high interest, a look at what's making headlines around the world. If you're an investor pursuing a 60-40 strategy, you might want to keep the ratio but drop the bonds. Strategists at Bank of America are urging portfolio managers to swap commodities in for fixed income as the asset class tends to perform better in a period of prolonged high inflation. Very similar to what AQR is saying, by the way. And ANZ Group, one of the Australia's largest banks, is re-examining its alcohol policies after complaints of inebriated staff on the trading floor. The policy review comes as part of a broader look into allegations of cultural problems at the banks, and three people have left the bank following reports of bad conduct. 
And there's about two months until the U.S. general election. Vice President Kamala Harris joined Tim Walz in an interview on CNN, and here's how she described her economic agenda last night. I would. I think, I think it's really important. I, I have spent my career inviting diversity of opinion. I think it's important to have people at the table when some of the most important decisions are being made that have different views, different experiences. And I think um, it would be to the benefit of the American public to have a member of my cabinet who was a Republican. Meanwhile, we're also taking a look at shares of Intel because Bloomberg News reporting that the company is discussing various scenarios with investment bankers, including a split of its product design and manufacturing businesses, as well as which factory projects might potentially be scrapped. And I will add, this is according to people familiar with the matter. Let's get more detail now from Bloomberg Technologies. Ed Ludlow joining us from San Francisco. And Ed, when you consider the Intel of yesteryear, it's stunning that we're even having this conversation. Conversation. So just give us some context here about who Intel used to be and how we ended up to where we are today. Yeah, we talk about the semiconductor industry here on Bloomberg Television more than we've ever done, probably. It is in vogue, essentially. But Intel is at the core of the semiconductor's history. And we use the phrase chip maker as a blanket term for all of the names that we talk about. But that's actually not quite right in many cases. It is definitely right in Intel's. Intel designs its own products, specific uh, processors and chips that do specific things, but it also manufactures them. While for a large body of all the other chip makers, other contract manufacturers do that for them. TSMC is the world's biggest contract manufacturer for chips. And Intel was the leader in both fields for so long, designing chips that do stuff and then building them. And that is no longer the case in either sense. And it is in financially perilous territory where it's trying to work out how it can regain leadership in both branches of its offering. Now, it's interesting, Ed, because Bloomberg has reported that they're working with their longtime investment bankers, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, yeah. to find options for the firm here. There's a reason that this is one of the most read stories of today, and it's because it could have a lot of Wall Street tied up into this turnaround story. What are the options out there for Intel? Yeah, and you know bankers, and you know that bankers worth their salt. Goldman and MS have been with Intel a long time. Look at a broad range of options. The nuclear option is to sell off or separate the foundry business. That is the business of being a contract manufacturer of semiconductors for others. Right now, uh, Intel's foundry business has one customer, and that is Intel. Mm -hmm. And what it wants to do is sell to others. So. That is in the pipeline, but I think that what we're hearing from sources is they've just got to continue cutting back. They have this huge ambitious turnaround under Pat Gelsinger that involves lots of expansion. And that expansion, bearing in mind the context of the $20 billion it got through the CHIPS Act, I think they'll start cutting back on some of those plans. Yeah, it seems like if you look at uh, sort of the sell side reaction here that it seems like one thing is certain and that is that they're going to cut back on CapEx yeah. over the next year or so, Ed. But I mean, couch this in the competitive landscape. Of course, we just got through NVIDIA earnings. You had that great sit down with CEO Jensen Huang. How steep is the mountain that Intel has to climb here? Well, the, the, the question is actually whether or not it's insurmountable. So let's take the market for AI accelerators. This year, NVIDIA will sell $100 billion of high-performance GPUs or AI accelerators. Intel, if it is lucky, will sell $500 million. We're, we're talking two completely different scales here. And when I spoke to Intel's CFO immediately following their last earnings, the first concession or admission he made to me was that they weren't at the races with GPUs. For a long time in the context of data center, they were the leader, but they were largely focused on CPU, central processing units. Uh, GPU is now the brain of the data center, the high value prospect. And so they had to be honest about that and say, we're not in that market enough. On the foundry business, again, it's a very simple case study. Intel has one foundry customer, which is Intel. TSMC serves everyone else, and there are some others like Samsung and Global Foundries. And they have not yet shown evidence of booking any third-party customers. Um, and that's the only way to, to stem the losses in that foundry unit, actually start doing business with other people. 
Ed, really quickly here in like 20 seconds, how vulnerable sure. is Intel? Because there were prior reports about worries about an activist investor potentially attacking this stock. Yeah. Uh, do you have an analyst telling us the model is effectively broken? Yeah, I, I just cite the line in the Bloomberg story by Ian King and our deals colleagues that Pat Gelsinger is running out of time. Bloomberg Technologies, Ed Ludlow, we thank you so very much for your time. And Katie, it's so fascinating here because you have to remember that so much of Wall Street, despite Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, are already so invested in the story. Brookfield, Apollo have already done deals with Intel. Mm -hmm. Apollo's deal was an $11 billion deal, one that was not only record setting for this kind of deal, but also landmark and really guiding the way that Apollo thinks about doing deals in the future. Right. A joint venture here to really expand on AI capabilities and uh, factory networks here and really think about expansion. Yeah, it'll be fascinating, of course, to see how those discussions involve. I'm glad you've asked about, asked about activists. What a phrase there. Uh, also in the story, I mean, there's the possibility of M&A here. And of course, we know there's a potential split up as well. So the board meetings in September, it's going to be really fascinating. Turnarounds are indeed costly. Now coming up, Intuitive Machines wins a NASA contract for a mission to the moon, South Pole. Oh, I'd like to be there too tonight. <laughs> Social Climbers up next. We'll talk right about that. This is Bloomberg. Lunar Lander. Vehicle pitching gun range. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company is making waves this morning. And first up, to infinity and beyond, Intuitive Machines won a nearly $117 million contract from NASA for a moon mission in 2027. The space startup, remember, went public last year and launched its first lunar mission back in February. Next up, Autodesk raising its full year earnings outlook following pressure from activist investor Starboard. Starboard has been pushing Autodesk to increase its margins and boot its current CEO. And finally, Dell reporting second quarter results that beat Wall Street expectations with particular strength in orders for AI servers. Dell Technologies COO Jeff Clark joins Bloomberg Technology at 11 a.m. New York time. And of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on T-R-E-N Go on your Bloomberg terminal, Shanali. And a check on futures here. Before the market open, we have a green day. S&P futures higher about four-tenths of 1% ahead of the market open. NASDAQ 100 futures up eight-tenths of 1%, almost nine-tenths. Russell 2000 up more than four-tenths of 1%. And of course, it's a fascinating week end of August in the green, but not without its choppiness. A clean day of PCE reads, but a busy week of economic data ahead. Now coming up, we're gonna to talk to Adam Hetz of Janice Henderson about his S&P 500 call. Stick with us for that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. All right, we are moments away from the official start of trading. 22 seconds to be exact until those bells really ring and trading opens up on this Friday. Welcome back to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Katie Greifeld. You take a look at futures right now. Pretty much green. You can see that across the board from big to small, which is amazing when you think about the volatility that we've seen in the past week, in the past month, really all summer long. But it looks like we're going to close out this trading week and this trading month with more gains on the screen. You can see, of course, the companies at the NASDAQ and at the NYSEs clapping right now, of course, as trading officially kicks off on this final trading day of August. You take a look at where the major averages are trading right now. Officially, we can say we do have green on the screen. The S&P 500 currently up to the tune of half a percent, even more so if you take a look at big tech. We had a really weird volatile day yesterday with Nvidia's fluctuations, but right now up by 1%. And the small caps also getting in on the action. The Russell 2000 currently up about four tenths of a percent. Now, one stock to keep an eye on at the open is Intel. Remember that Bloomberg News reporting the company is discussing various scenarios with investment bankers as it struggles to appease investors. It may split its product design and manufacturing businesses, as well as put some factory projects on hold. This is according to people familiar with the matter. You take a look at the reaction in shares right now, and it seems like there's an embrace of that possibility. Intel currently up about 5%, Chanali. A few other stocks we're watching. The, as the market opens here, Marvel Technology up more than 11%. This chip maker is soaring after a strong second quarter results and a promising revenue outlook. Analysts are noting that demand for AI products for this company is fueling growth. 
and Lululemon higher. Despite lowering its sales and profit outlook for the year, the company cited increased competition and inflation. But analysts say the guidance cut was already baked into the share price, and you now have Lululemon up more than 2% as the market opens. And for more Lululemon, we're going to be joined by Poonam Goyal, Bloomberg Intelligence, a senior analyst for e-commerce and athleisure. And it's interesting, if you look at the headwinds, yes, maybe they have been baked into the price here. But are there perhaps headwinds that the market is not seeing that could meet this company in the coming months? Sure. I think, you know, what we really need to focus on here is the product. So they talked a lot about traffic being positive both online and in stores. So it's the conversion that fell short. And that was due to missteps in women's where they didn't have the right silhouette. They didn't have the colors, the patterns. So really what I'm watching for over the next three to six months is that reintroduction of color, silhouettes, patterns to see if the consumer is responding. And if that's the case, then I think, you know, they'll continue to move forward. But if we don't see that, I think there could be more missteps leading to possibly even lower results. Poonam, I was saying to Shanali uh, before this block started that, full disclosure, I really like uh, Lululemon. I really like Peloton. I use uh, both of those brands very frequently. I know you don't cover Peloton, so I won't ask you, but it's interesting that you do have all of this brand recognition when it comes to both of these companies, and yet you take a look at the stock performance, you wouldn't necessarily know it. And to your point, when it comes to the branding and the silhouettes, et cetera, you have Jeffries out with a note saying that Maybe the brand has peaked now. Maybe style is shifting. And you think about sort of the, uh, the re-embrace of baggy jeans, et cetera. I mean, how difficult is it for Lululemon just to keep up with current fashion trends? Well, they're, they're trying, right? So they're trying to go beyond that aligned legging, right? They're introducing baggier fit, more casual fit in men's and women's. And it's going to take time. That's not what Lululemon is known for. They're known for that wear to the run. You know, that's what you're wearing to the yoga studio. That's what you're wearing to the gym, but not necessarily when you're just hanging out with friends or going out. So so they're trying to change a little, but I wouldn't expect them to change too much. I think there'll be a balance, but the customer does love the brand to your point. And I think that's the one thing that's going great for them. It's it's if they get the right product, I think they'll do just fine. It comes back down to product. Very hilarious that you say that because I was just telling Katie that my <laughs> spending power has moved and I love Lululemon as well from Lululemon leggings to cowboy boots <laughs> this year. Uh, but at the end of the day, another thing that I'm interested in here, you had Lululemon, for example, invest in different things, right? Like footwear. But at the same time, you see brands like Abercrombie and Fitch also moving into that athleisure category. Are they just facing more competition for this lifestyle brand that is attracting attention elsewhere? Yes, yeah, so definitely there's more competition in the competitive landscape. But that said, I would also say that that athleisure is growing as a whole globally too, right? Whether it's international or here, more people are more active. They are going to the gym more. They are spending time outdoors more. So it's a category where everyone can gain share, but competition will be tougher as everyone. Not just Abercrombie, but even the Amazons, the Walmarts, the Targets, Aloe, you know, you name it. It's coming from everywhere, high to low end. All right, Poonam, really appreciate your time. Of course, Poonam Goyal of Bloomberg Intelligence talking about Lululemon down just an absolutely punishing 49% year to date. We're going to continue to follow that story. But let's broaden out this conversation now with Adam Hetz. He is global head of multi-asset over at Janice Henderson. And I won't ask you about Lululemon, of course, and whether you shop there, but I do want to talk about market fragility because back in June, you highlighted that risk factor and you said that a 10% correction is more likely than not. You think about July, you think about August, and all the volatility that we've seen. Are we past the worst of that correction? Well, good morning, Katie, Sonali. And I might have a little bit of Lululemon in the closet, <laughs> but moving on back to my last uh, time as a guest in the show, and thanks for having me back. Yeah, that was mid-June. I talked about the fragility in the market. To your point, I talked about the likelihood of a 10% correction, uh, probably being more probable by the end of the year uh, than not but still thinking we'd end positive for the year. And then mid-July, that fragility in our view translated into that 8.5% drawdown that finished off early August. So our view at this point is the market did pass a bit of a test. We like 5,600 a little bit better this time around, but with this round trip that we've had, we're also back to a lot of the fragility that drove that sensitivity that triggered that pretty abrupt drawdown that we saw in mid-July. 
So we're standing here the last trading day of August and everyone's coming back from a Labor Day weekend next week and you have a new setup, one where the election is around the corner, one where a little bit of leverage has been popped out of the system this month. So how do you expect the story to go from here? Who's going to be investing in the market when we come back and how will they be investing in it? Well, on the note of coming back, it, it's nice having the data print this morning as far as PCE and the consumer. I think we can check that one off. Uh, it's a nice print going into the long weekend. And then now we're looking forward to a week from today with NFP, the non-farm payrolls, uh, the 11th CPI. That leads up to potentially historic decisions on September 18th. So our base case here is that the S&P should and, and could just grind higher from here. And, and most investors will continue this broadening trade that's fueled by solid GDP, uh, the broadening into better earnings. But I think there are a lot of risks out there that we have to remind ourselves we are in this late cycle environment. Uh, for example, earlier in the year in our model portfolios, we saw more of a mid-cycle true reacceleration in the economic data. So we broadened our portfolios down in cap, international, more of those cyclical markets. At this point, we think the bar is a bit higher to add risk from here. So we want to see how this Goldilocks narrative ensues from here. And if that's challenged again whatsoever, that, that fragility across earnings expectations, where current valuations are, it, it could drive another drawdown down before the end of the year. Well, let's talk about where we are in the calendar year as well, because if you crack open the stock traders almanac, September has been the biggest percentage loser for both the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones since 1950. You think about those risks ahead that you neatly laid out for us. Are you expecting history to repeat itself here when it comes to the seasonality effect? Well, maybe I can do you one better on history lessons. If we're going back to the 1940s on GDP, as we were thinking about that 3% GDP print last quarter, we don't think there's a whole lot of forward-looking guidance in that. We like that we're not seeing fractures or cracks in the surface and the foundation we're all standing on with the economy. But average GDP going back to the 1940s before a recession, the quarter before a recession was 2.7 real. So that gives you the appropriate grain of salt as far as interpreting GDP. So I think you're talking about September going forward, going back to Goldilocks, there's a lot baked in to market expectations right now. And we have multiples 10, 20% above historic multiples, never mind how far above we are recessionary type multiples. Again, that goes back to this being a nervous market, laser focus on the data. We have the smallest hiccup on NFP, on CPI. To your point, that could drive a weak September. Uh, that's not our base case. Again, our base case is S&P continues to grind higher, but we're on guard and we're being cautious and we're watching the data very closely, of course. I also want to talk about sectors a little bit here because you look at the month to date. It's pretty fascinating what you're seeing in terms of investor flows here. You, de you do see some of that broadening trade occurring. You do see consumer staples, real estate, financials, utilities, healthcare, all doing better, but energy and consumer discretionary really lagging behind. When you look at September, do you extrapolate from this? Do you see more of this or do you see uh, some reversal in some degrees? Good question. I'm glad you're getting into sectors beyond just technology. And so we like that broadening trade. That's very satisfying as a portfolio manager as far as the impacts that has on a well-diversified portfolio and, and long overdue. You talk about energy, you talk about discretionary. That's another good reminder that we are in this late cycle environment. Late cycle can go on for a long time and that's the base case again. But you're also seeing these pockets of weakness in some places. I wouldn't extrapolate that too far. When we're looking at this broadening trade, GDP, earnings, the broader sentiment, optimism on rate cuts. What we're seeing here is Russell 2000's beat the S&P over the last three months. That's phenomenal. And even over the last month, you've even had international developed uh, the MSCI EFA index beating the S&P over the trailing month. So that's wonderful to see in portfolios that the sort of baton is being passed from the AI trade and tech trade into the rest of the broader market, not just US, but internationally as well. Adam, we thank you so much for your time. That is Janice Henderson, Global Head of Multi-Asset. Adam Hetz, have a great weekend to you. We're going to take a look at some movers this morning because, yes, we are up on the S&P 500, but certain stocks are certainly down on the day. Lululemon in particular, we were talking about it. People had thought here that the cuts were really priced in, but now we're seeing the stock lower by 1.7%. MongoDB just on a tear, Katie, up more than 17% today after promising earnings results here. You are seeing very interesting movement in the tech sector. I would also note, not on this board, Dell as well, flying higher. Ulta Beauty now down 4.4%. I know you were watching that. We both love to mm -hmm. buy makeup. <laughs> and so, uh, obviously, Berkshire Hathaway has loved to buy Ulta as well, but not feeling the love from that stock today.
Definitely a summer Friday with Shanali and I just going into our spending habits, but uh, <laughs> definitely some interesting movement there at the single stock level. And coming up, it's being called one of the strongest turnarounds in retail history. We'll tell you what CEO is being credited for the positive pivot in today's top calls. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Top Calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, City upgrading Abercrombie & Fitch to a buy. The analyst says that Abercrombie had one of the strongest turnarounds in retail history, adding that CEO Fran Horowitz has shown she has her finger on the pulse of their consumer. We spoke to her Horowitz earlier this week about the turnaround. We've spent a lot of years transforming this company and really rebuilding our operating model. And we've spent time and time and time again with the investors really explaining and helping them understand what all of that means. What that means is staying close to your customer, making sure that we're reading and reacting to the business, having financial discipline and how we control our inventories. Um, it's, a, it's a new way of thinking about retail and our operating model continues to, to drive results. And next up, Morgan Stanley says that Dollar General is no longer a buy and shaving its price target by $70. The analyst says that there is greater uncertainty around whether the discount retailer can stabilize its market share position. Dollar General reported bleak second quarter sales weighed down by a weaker low-end consumer. And finally, Raymond James cutting its price rating, its target on Ulta Beauty to outperform and cutting its price target by $50. The analysts citing the impact of competition and a softer macroeconomic environment. Ulta trimming its sales forecast as more consumers cut back on cosmetics. And let's discuss this now with Bloomberg's Afanasieva joining us. And I'm really curious about just the context and the contour of this year, because in the first quarter, it seemed like beauty was where you want to be. And obviously, you take a look at the share since then, and something has changed here. Absolutely. Yes, it's both a structural change and a change that's uh, ultra specific. Um, on the one hand, you've got consumers trading down and spending less um, and experiencing weakness after a strong period of inflation and high interest rates. There's, of course, the dupes that we all know. Why spend uh, spend a lot of money on a product where you can have the Walgreens equivalent um, with the same Ingredients, they might not be of the same quality, who knows, um, but they cost a lot less. And then in Ulta's case, it's been complaining about having Sephora shops open, for example, in the same area. So they're having to work harder to compete for their piece of the pie because it's just such a com competitive sector in beauty and skincare. At the end of the day, when you look at the stock price reaction down another 3% and bringing the year-to-date declines to almost 30%, Dasha, how much needs to change at this company to change investor sentiment around it? I mean, it's rare to see such a sharp downgrade. And you sort of wonder how, how could things have changed so much in the last month that you're uh, forecasting, you know, a decline of 2% sort of rather than uh, up to a 2 to 3% increase in sales for the year. So I do think a sort of a more radical overhaul uh, is probably called for, um, or I, I'd be calling for it if I were an investor. Um, but on the other hand, if part of problem is that there are Sephora stores close by. You can't very well overnight up sticks and, and leave and change the location of your stores. So I think that it's about a a, a cleverer marketing strategy uh, and and definitely promotional activity, which of course, you know, may, will have an impact on margin. Um, but I think that the company's got to unveil, unveil something that will at least convince investors that it's doing well in a tough market rather than doing poorly in a very tough market. And I want to uh, build on that conversation because you mentioned the competition and you mentioned marketing. And you think about what's going on over at Sephora, of course, one of the biggest competitors to Ulta, and it's TikTok. I mean, it has just gone absolutely viral. And when it comes to how Ulta sort of climbs this mountain here, I don't know how you engineer a viral campaign. It seems like a tall order. I think, yes, it's TikTok, which is which you have to know how to do. And I guess it's the case of hiring executives who get it and who get how to market this way, get to, how to market to these generations. Um, I think also, um, if you if you look at some of the beauty retailers they've done in the UK, Space NK is fighting back. 
tech um, and they do quite well on membership and on expertise um, and you know membership cards are a way to also uh, drive consumer loyalty I think data is a massive one um, one of the in this result season one of the things I found most interesting was Walmart talking about how they're using AI uh, to predict the demand for products where uh, I think they said it was they, they could use 950 million data points created or improved using AI and if they had done this with human uh, it would have taken taken way more people so I think it's that kind of smart investment but it, you're right it's definitely an uphill struggle in a very competitive space. Dasha we thank you so much for your reporting that is Bloomberg's Dasha Afanasieva very sorry thank you for your time now coming up Izzy Englander picks his next fund to back we're going to have details next on what's going on in the world of hedge funds in today's Wall Street beat this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's take a look at stocks about 22 minutes into the U.S. trading day. You can see a rally on our hands right now, led by big tech. The S&P 500 up about six-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100 up about one percent at this moment after a very volatile end to this week. It looks like we'll end in the green if this holds, but you never know. You take a look at the small caps getting in on the action, but to a lesser degree. The Russell 2000 currently up about three-tenths of a percent tonally. And it's time now for the Wall Street Beat. Izzy Englander has been making a lot of news this week. His Millennium Fund is backing another external investment firm. It's been happening in a string of investments, but this time he's backing a technology-focused hedge fund, Analog Century Management, headed by Val Zlatev. Joining us now is Bloomberg hedge fund reporter Nishant Kumar, who has been reporting on this, let's say, phenomenon, because you have Millennium that has its own pods, and now you have Millennium looking to external managers why? Well, that's a very, very interesting question, and that's the hottest trend in the hedge fund industry right now. It was not meant to be like this. In an ideal world, Millennium would want all these traders to come inside and trade for them. But there is a huge talent crunch going on in the industry right now. Not everyone is available uh, to be hired. People have their own ambition. Uh, to run their own firm. So this is Millennium's second best option. Everyone is doing that, but Millennium is the most aggressive uh, hedge fund uh, to allocate capital to external managers, roughly about a tenth of their investment mm -hmm. teams, and there are 330 of them uh, are external now. That's absolutely fascinating. And this all comes against the backdrop, Nishant, of a very volatile August. And Millennium is one of the larger hedge funds also that has actually had to close some of its own pods this month after the turmoil we saw. Can you explain what we've seen this month? Yeah, absolutely. So Millennium has, we have reported three pod closure. Uh, to be fair, I mean, they have more than 330 of them. So it's still a very tiny number of people who have been let go. Uh, and it always happens whenever uh, there is a market chaos, uh, some or the other trader will get caught. He loses a little bit of money and all these hedge funds run with really tight risk limits. Like you lose 5%, your capital is cut. If you lose 7%, you are out. So whenever traders find themselves really vulnerable in this sort of a market that we saw in August, and, and that's what happened across platforms, across industries. We have seen people being stopped out and fired and, and, and losing their pods. Nishant, we're going to have to have you back and early next week to talk about what this all looks like. Of course, month end means month end returns as well, Katie. Yeah, it's going to be uh, fun to talk about that one. Bloomberg's Nishant Kumar, thank you so much. And let's get to the trading diary, what you need to be watching next week. And I'm thrilled to report that on Monday it is Labor Day and U.S. markets are closed. Then we're back in action on Tuesday. We get ISM manufacturing data for August. On Wednesday, we get earnings from Dick's Sporting Goods and Dollar Tree. Remember what we heard from dollar general so things might look i don't know a little bit dicey there you also get jolts data and that's ahead of the big one friday's u.s jobs report all eyes on that one you take a look at where markets are right now though shanali we are in the green you know we got that pci data pce data rather uh at 8 30 a.m eastern pretty tepid overall and looks like uh investors are taking that as a buy signal the s p 500 currently up about six tenths of a percent and it's big tech that's leaving the action right now no news is good news 
on the economic front, but next week is the big week. And you know what? A lot of people still might be off given Monday. That's true. They God, might want to come back. God bless them. And watch know. open interest. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, of course. Uh, don't go anywhere, though. Coming up in the next hour, we'll speak to Elias Sabo. He is the CEO of Compass Diversified. Of course, the CEO of what some people call a baby Berkshire. We'll talk about all that and more coming up. This is Bloomberg. minutes into the U.S. trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Shanali Basic. Matt Miller is off today. Coming back next week, though. Now, coming up, marching on, stocks close in on a fourth month of gains as the latest inflation data reinforces bets that the Fed will co start cutting in September. And Kamala Harris speaks in her first TV interview as Democratic nominee, saying that voters are ready to turn the page on Donald Trump. She's now leading or tied in all seven swing states, according to Bloomberg's latest poll. And as Buffett's Berkshire tops a trillion dollars in market value, we're going to speak with the CEO of a company with a similar business model, Compass Diversified. He's got a plus on middle market firms, Katie. And let's get a check of these markets right now because we do have a rally on our hands, which is nice to see after the weird action of yesterday. Remember, we were up by quite a bit. Then we had a big drawdown in the second half of the day and ended up just about flat on the S&P 500. Different story right now. The S&P 500 sitting on gains of about seven tenths of a percent, even more so if you take a look at the big tech index, the Nasdaq 100 up about 1.2%. Of course, you think about the volatility that we saw with NVIDIA yesterday. Eventually, it did manage to drag down the NASDAQ 100, but that's your outperformer on the day. And you're finding stability in the bond market right now. The 10-year yield currently, I'm going to call it that exactly unchanged, camped out at about 3.86%, Shanali. It's pretty fascinating. Bringing you some breaking news now as well. University of Michigan sentiment data coming in. And the final August consumer sentiment data had risen to 67 7.9. Listen, that is below the estimate of 68.1, but expected inflation falls to 2.8 percent, which is the lowest since 2020. And as we know, uh, that expectation of where inflation is going is very important to how consumers will behave. We are now joined by Crossmark Global Chief Market Strategist Victoria Fernandez. And let's talk about this consumer because, yes, we do have really promising data here. Mm -hmm. We actually had promising data in the GDP as well, but we have that jobs data next week. Right. So a lot of uncertainty and, frankly, we're caught in the crosshairs. How do you handicap what's going on right now? Yeah, consumers are absolutely the biggest concern that we have right now. I mean, they are the driver of this economy and they are led by wages and by um, income. So when we look at what's happening, if you kind of look under the hood, I mean, GDP went up, it was revised, but GDI, the income component, was actually not that strong at all. And so you want to see this income continue in order to support the consumer. I just don't think we're seeing it. Next week, I know everyone's looking at Friday for the jobs report, but I actually think the JOLTS report is going to be more important than the jobs report because it's telling you the hiring rate. That is what gives you a really good feel for what's going on in the labor market. And hiring rate is down 43% for the first seven months of this year versus the seven months of last year. Job losses are up, quits are down, wages are stagnating. All of that will come out of the JOLTS report and I think it gives us a good feel for what that consumer is positioned to do going forward. At the end of the day, if you're worried about the consumer going forward, what does that mean in terms of what you expect of easing for the consumer if you see that first interest rate cut in September? Uh, that's pretty much a, a, a will happen at this point. But do you need to see more than 25 to really start making a dent? 25 really isn't going to make uh, that big of a difference, I think, to most people. Um, I don't think you're going to go out and buy a car because 25 basis points less. Or a house. Right? Or a house. <laughs> yeah. I just don't think that's going to be your, your driving factor there. So 
you know, just like we have lags when rates are moving higher, there's going to be a lag as rates move lower too. And I think it's that period between still having the lags from higher rates filter through this economy, waiting for the effects of lower rates to happen, that really is going to give us the volatility and the concerns we have in this market. Yes, I think 25 basis points is what we see from the FOMC meeting in September. I actually think we only get one more this year, probably in December, and the market may have to reprice a little bit because right now they're saying 100 basis points. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, if we only get two and we have four priced in, it feels like, I don't know, some of the investors out there on the street are a little bit giddy because <laughs> they fought the Fed and yes. they kind of won. When you think about uh, sort of the resolve to hold rates steady, mm -hmm. now you have the Fed and Jerome Powell all but saying, we are going to cut right. in September and then keep cutting. What would the adjustment from pricing in four cuts to two cuts look like when you think about the S&P 500, the big tech names. Yeah, so we're looking at an S&P right now after the pullback and then such a quick, uh, you know, kind of whipsaw back to where we were. You're looking at an S&P that's tactically in an overbought position. We're going into a very weak season for the month of September, historically, and the market usually does not do so great three months following the first rate cut. So it's actually a very tough environment we're going into here for the rest of the year. I think you get that 25 basis points, then I think the Fed wants to wait. They want to take their time, see what happens, see some of the data that comes in, maybe take a break around the election uh, time period, and then come back and continue um, cutting at the end of the year. They don't want to go too quickly and stoke demand and stoke inflation, but at the same time, they want to support the consumer. So it's a very thin line that they have to walk there. So how should investors be putting this all together? Because even with the volatility that we've seen this summer, I mean, mm -hmm. we're sitting on pretty healthy year-to-date we gains. We're entering into what we know is going to be a pretty volatile season. And I mean, do you just be happy with what you have? Do you just sort of sit tight through year ends? Well, you definitely don't want to stand in way of the momentum of the market and you want to participate in that upside. But I don't think that means that you have to be completely risk on. I think it gives you the ability to be a little bit cautious in your approach. So look at some of those larger cap staples. Staples usually do better after a first rate cut. Look at some healthcare names, same situation there. We've been trimming tech and adding to some of the financials for the course of this year. So there's elements you you can do some tactical shifts you can do in your portfolio to put a little more defensive play to go along with the volatility that we expect and perhaps a, a pull down if the consumer does slow down more, but yet you're still participating in this market. So I think that's how you need to position. You know, the people that we speak to on the show all week have been calling this a broadening trade. It was mm -hmm. a rotation trade, now it's the broadening right. trade. What do you broaden into, especially because in this broadening trade, there have been some notable sectors left out, some places tied to the consumer mm -hmm. and even energy, which is a little strange <laughs> considering what you've seen with energy prices this week. So a lot of the broadening that we've seen um, has been tied to the small caps, right? We've seen the Russell 2000 really do well. You look at the end of last week, Russell 2000 had a plus 27 to 1. Um, so really strong breadth. Based on our outlook, we're not so sure that that's where you want to go right now. If you have a little bit of exposure, that's fine, but we would be cautious with small caps. Maybe wait till some of this plays out, some of the volatility we expect play out. Go back to some of those more defensive plays that we like. I think you can broaden out that way and then wait for earnings to broaden out. That's going to be key for next year. I'm surprised you didn't pick up on financials. That's like your best. <laughs> I know. have been holding myself back from this. We can talk it's more about that It's been a great a place to be invested this year. Yeah. Yeah. Stocks are small stocks. Here, at the end of the day, it's really those investment banks, JP Morgan, yes. Goldman Sachs, that have felt that love. Not so much many of those regionals. In this type of environment, you want to look at those companies that have strong cash flows, consistent earnings, um, you know, the ability to withstand volatility, those are the larger banks. You have to be cautious on the smaller banks because I know we haven't seen the real estate issues come to fruition like many thought they would, but those small regional banks still do have a lot of exposure. We like those larger banks and they've been doing well. Well, at least on the larger banks, it seems like uh, Wells Fargo's Mike Mayo agrees with you. He was out with a note earlier saying that bank stocks to rally with rate cuts and no recession, which is all great, but sort of a concept that we've been batting around for the past couple of weeks is it feels like the broadening is nice to have, but what a need to have is when you think about the broad index level is that tech performance, that tech participation, just if you do the math mm -hmm. on the index level. And with that being said, I mean, what is the outlook for tech? <laughs> 
Well, they've definitely been driving the market for the past year and a half, two years. We've seen them pull back this year, and that's where everyone's saying we need to see others step up. So does tech continue to grow? Does it continue to do well? Yes, and you look at these names. Look, we have long-term investors that we're working with. Do they want to have Microsoft and Apple, these names in their portfolio? Absolutely they do. Do you want to have exposure to NVIDIA? Yes. But can you be a little bit underweight? Can you take some of your gains that you've gotten so far this year, trim that down, take those funds, and then put them in some of these other areas we've been talking about? Yes. So you want tech to do well. There's such a large percentage of the index, right? I mean, NVIDIA itself is 6% of the index. I think that's almost the entire weight of the staples. So you have to have some exposure. But I think if you believe other areas are going to do better, you can underweight that sector and start allocating to some other places. You know, the other thing that you were saying about the large financial, something that's been amusing me in this market, Katie, is that you have banks making money on M&A. You have them also making a lot of money on turnaround stories. That yeah. is spinoffs. That is activist investors. <laughs> that is bankruptcies and yes. restructurings. This is a costly market for a corporation, right? You see Intel just soaring this morning off of Bloomberg's report that they right. are talking to their bankers. When you look at these turnaround stories, even certain analysts seeking bigger turnarounds at places like Ulta, mm -hmm. do you buy into a turnaround story? Is that where some of the biggest opportunity could be at the single stock level? It could be, Sonali. I mean, I think there are those opportunities out there. There are those single stock elements that you can look at. But I also think you want to take a broader approach, right? Look at it from a macro perspective and say, are these just small one-offs that are happening? Or are we walking into an environment where the economy is going to pull back enough where we're going to need to see some consolidations, some mergers, some buyouts? It could absolutely happen that way, and banks will be a beneficiary of that for sure. And before we let you go, just quickly, I'm curious. I mean, you talk about not being too, you know, idiosyncratic, yeah. but it feels like it's really hard to look at an industry and paint with a broad brushstroke here. I mean, you think about it what is. we saw from Dollar General, I mm -hmm. believe, the state of that low-income consumer, and then you think about Walmart taking right. share from uh, a dollar store such as that one. I mean, it just feels like... There's so many nuances when you look at these earnings reports. It's a very bifurcated market, and it's across the board, right? Retail earnings completely confused me with some of the things that we were seeing. Walmart pulling share, but not necessarily for the lower and middle income, but they're pulling share on the higher income consumer as well. So it makes sense that they were doing better. But you see a lot of other stores that typically do well in Ulta and Lululemon missing estimates, not doing well showing you that the consumer is, you know, pulling back and doing that. That bifurcation is across the board in different industries. So you do have to be selective. You can't just buy all of one sector. Um, and you got to do your homework. Look at those earnings. Look at those cash flows and balance sheets. All right. That's a good place to leave it. Do your homework. That's right. Victoria, it's always great to see you. Great to see you in person, too. That, of My course, pleasure. is Crossmark. Global Chief Market Strategist, Victoria Fernandez. Meanwhile, let's take a look at some of these movers because it's still earnings season. Somehow you take a look at Lululemon, for example, you can share, see shares kind of wavering back and forth. They were lower. Now they're a little bit higher. Of course, up 1%, even though they warned about that sales forecast. Ulta Beauty, different story there. Of course, down about 2% on disappointing earnings. Had been down more, though, about 7% pre-market. So some of those losses coming back. And then Intel. We know the story there. Of course, Bloomberg News reporting that uh, they're talking to bankers about potential options here. A very tough time for a 56-year-old company. Shareholders seem to be embracing that right now. Intel up about 7.5%. Now coming up, VP Kamala Harris, her comments on inflation, the border, energy, and more in her first major interview since running for president. Details next. This is Bloomberg. And now to high interest, a look at what's making headlines around the world. And if you're an investor pursuing a 60-40 strategy, you might want to keep the ratio but drop some of the bonds. Strategists at Bank of America are urging portfolio managers to swap commodities in for fixed income as the asset class tends to perform better in a period of prolonged high inflation. And MasterCard is doubling down on efforts to eliminate use of credit card numbers when customers make purchases online. And the move is the latest by the company to 
to try and fight fraud in e-commerce. And there's about two months until the U.S. general election. Vice President Kamala Harris joined Tim Walz in an interview on CNN. And here's how she described her economic agenda last night. It's what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries. For example, dealing with an issue like price gouging. What we need to do to extend the child tax credit to help young families be able to take care of their children in their most formative years. What we need to do to bring down the cost of housing. And for more on Harris, we're joined now by Bloomberg senior White House and politics correspondent Gregory Cordy joining us from Washington. And so I liked what you said in the commercial break, that basically Kamala Harris needed to rip the Band-Aid off here. We had been waiting for her first interview, of course, not sort of a teleprompter read, but somewhere where she'd actually have to interact and engage with questions from the press. What has the reception been like so far? Yeah, she's been in this race now uh, a little more than a month. This is the first sit-down interview she's done through all of that. And so, as you said, she, there was something she needed to do. She needed to tick off the box. And look, she if you were looking for her to put a lot more meat on the bone in terms of policy, in terms of what a Harris administration will do, especially how it would differentiate itself from a Biden administration, you were probably disappointed. But she can say that she did it. She probably didn't do herself a whole lot of damage. And, and I think it, it gave her a little bit more exposure to a national audience of, of who she is and kind of get a sense of how she sees this campaign, what value she's going to bring to it. Uh, so in that sense, no, I don't, I, I don't think she did uh, herself any harm. But it also wasn't, uh, you know, a, a, she probably didn't win a whole lot of new votes either. Right. Well, let's sit on that point a little bit longer, that she didn't do any harm. Was that really the goal for this appearance? You think about all the momentum she's had in the past month, of course, and you've seen that in the polls as well. It seems like, of course, not doing harm here maybe was the right tack to take. Look, modern political campaigns are extremely risk averse, and it's pretty rare uh, to see a candidate go into a, a, an interview with a, a, a hostile or even a neutral interview. Both candidates, uh, you see this especially on the Trump side, really going to Fox News, some conservative media to, to have his message. It's not very often that he sits down with a, a more mainstream outlet. And we've even seen this with the, the debates. We are going to have a debate, we think, on September 10th. But the whole debate regime has broken down as candidates, uh, we saw with Joe Biden, it is a very high stakes endeavor. Uh, the debate in June can make or break a campaign, and it broke Joe Biden's campaign. So, yeah, both campaigns are going to be really cautious uh, going into the final couple of months not to do anything that, that might uh, get them into a situation where they might make a gaffe or, or, or a big mistake that the opponent can seize on. Gregory, at the end of the day, when you look at the way the interview went last night, risk-averse is the word a lot of people are using, how does that pair with what you're seeing in the polls? Was so much of this risk aversion meant to keep a little bit of status quo in her standings? Yeah, so what we've seen, and we have a new uh, Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll just out last night uh, that shows that she's continuing to build on the momentum uh, ever since she was uh, took the, the reins of the nomination from Joe Biden. Harris is now up by two percentage points across the, the seven swing states that we look at. That's among registered voters. Among likely voters, it's one percentage point. We're going to start talking a lot more about likely voters after Labor Day. Uh, and so did she get a post-convention bounce that we all look for traditionally after accepting the nomination in Chicago last week? No, probably not. There's a, maybe a one-point uh, increase since last month. That's well within the margin of error. Uh, but she continues to have this momentum, and she's now tied or leading Trump in all seven swing states. It's still uh, on a razor's edge, edge this race. Uh, it could go either way, but you would rather be in Harris's shoes than Trump's, and that's what making her a little bit more cautious and a little bit more defensive. It's now incumbent on Trump to sort of seize back the narrative, seize back the advantage. Yeah, like you said, of course, a dead heat when it comes to this Bloomberg morning consult hole, when it comes to these very crucial swing states. But when it comes to Harris's polling here, how does the economy factor in? You think about some of the uh, top, top issues in this election, and increasingly it just looks like it's really this focus on the economy. 
Yeah, and uh, as, as you know, the, the economy is the top issue in this election and every election. And when we look underneath what's going on, these top line horse race numbers, we're trying to figure out what, what's driving that. And interestingly, voters' perceptions of the economy have not changed since Joe Biden was the Democratic candidate. Uh, people still say prices are too high and going higher. People, a majority of swing state voters still say they were better off under Trump than they are under Biden. But the thing is, they're not holding that against Kamala Harris. If you look at a whole bunch of different measures of candidate trust, we asked on a bunch of economic issues, uh, do you trust Harris or Trump more? She has now taken the high ground on issues like housing costs, uh, pay raises, uh, personal debt, things like student loans and credit card debt. And she's closed the gap on a, a number of other issues, importantly inflation. She has improved her numbers considerably. She still trails Trump on the inflation trust question, but she has narrowed that gap considerably. And so when people look at Kamala Harris, they are not associating her with the Bidenomics that wasn't going over well uh, with the, the Biden campaign before he dropped out. Gregory Cordy in Washington, we thank you so much for the latest polling and, of course, the readout from last night's Harris and Walls interview. And for the latest on the U.S. election, head to ELEC, elect, go on your Bloomberg terminals. Of course, all the latest on what's happening ahead of November. But still ahead, we're going to talk about Starbucks, where more trouble is brewing. We're going to talk about a new lawsuit that alleges the company deceived investors. That's in Social Climbers next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning. And first up, Starbucks getting hit with a class action lawsuit that accuses it of misleading investors about its financial health and growth prospects. The lawsuit alleges that, law, that Starbucks rather provided overly optimistic revenue projections while hiding significant challenges, especially in the Chinese market. Starbucks says that the allegations are without merit. Next up, Alibaba is securing the endorsement of China's antitrust watchdog after three years of a probe into its online behavior. The move suggests that Beijing is keen to signal its support for the country's giant internet sector. And finally, Emergent Biosolutions announcing that the FDA granted approval for its smallpox vaccine for use in people at high risk of MPOX. It's the second approved shot against MPOX in the U.S., and it comes as a new MPOX strain is spreading in Africa. And of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal, Shanali. I'm going to check on these markets, Katie, because, of course, we are ending this August on an up day, at least. Of course, it's been a tougher week for the S&P 500, uh, about to end in the red for the week. But up on the day, four-tenths of one percent, calm in the markets before a long holiday weekend. Nasdaq 100 up almost eight-tenths of one percent, and the bond market steady after that PCE and University of Michigan sentiment data. Of course, the big week is next week with that jobs data, isn't it? Big, big week next week. And of course, September, a seasonally ugly month. So we'll see how that one shakes out. But Buckle up. Coming up on this program, the investment holding company Compass Diversified. We'll speak with the CEO next. This is Bloomberg. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway becoming the eighth U.S. company to top a trillion dollars in market value. We're going to turn to a public company with a similar investment profile, Compass Diversified. It acquires controlling interests in middle market consumer names, giving shareholders access. For more, we're joined by Elias Sabo, Compass Diversified CEO. And of course, this kind of model of buying into a range of companies here has become a really hot topic on Wall Street. Elias. But everyone knows who watches Berkshire Hathaway. So much of the magic really comes from not only that focus on value, but the cost of funding that is required to make those investments. We're on the precipice of a historic interest rate cut. How much will that make a difference to your business? Yeah, Sonali, it's, you know, huge in our business. And if you think about what Berkshire has done 
um, very similar to what we're trying to do is <clears throat> create a sustained cost of capital advantage relative to our peers. Berkshire has done it magically with, you know, kind of an insurance holding company that has helped to, you know, fund their business. We do it through having a holding company that does the financing rather than at the subsidiaries and getting the arbitrage of financing with scale. Um, and so in both models, cost of capital is imperative. Um, as that cost comes down, clearly we and our competitive set um, and peers are going to benefit from that. But in absolute valuation of the assets, um, you know, it is a positive to have rates come down and, you know, it's positive for the valuation of our portfolio. It's kind of fascinating to talk to you at a time here where you see a market that for a moment got addicted to small and mid caps and then pulled back on that bet, worried about the leverage in that system and worried about growth moving forward in the economy. At the end of the day, this is a market that you're highly levered to, the middle market. What comes from here? You do see that potential reduction in interest rates, potentially at a significant pace, but you still have those growth concerns. How do you get past them? Yeah, so between the first and second quarter, we saw a market downturn in activity. And, you know, that can be anything from sales that we're realizing, um, you know, kind of in the quarter to bookings that we're getting for some of our companies with a longer lead time. And so far in the third quarter, we've seen that steady out a little bit. So, you know, sort of like the car went from third gear to second gear and has sort of stayed there. Um, you know, on the other side, on the cost side, we've been seeing inflation come down now for the better part of the last 12 months. And, you know, labor pressures have really eased. Some of the, ma the macro data has been supporting that recently. And frankly, it feels a lot like pre-pandemic where Customers are asking for price declines. We're trying to get that from our vendors as well. So it feels like inflation is dead. To me, that feels like a pretty good in, uh, you know, environment where the soft landing narrative feels like it's in play right now. Yes, growth is slowing, but our cost of capital is coming down even faster. It feels like um, you know, growth could pick up six to nine months based on how quickly the Fed acts. And, you know, it feels like the Fed is inclined to be cutting. You know, my view is they need to cut a little faster than probably what the market is pricing in right now, mm. just because conditions do feel like they're softening. But more importantly, inflation concerns seem like they are, you know, near dead at this point. Well, let's bring this conversation, of course, to deployment opportunities, because if we continue on with the Berkshire uh, metaphor here, of course, your company is thought of as one of the baby Berkshires that are out there. I mean, you think about what Warren Buffett is doing. He's sitting on approximately a mountain of cash. I think it's safe to say, rather, because he just doesn't see the opportunity out there. You look at, of course, your history. You've completed 58 acquisitions since you IPO'd in 2006. What's your opportunity set right now? Yeah, Katie, it's been a really weak M&A market over the last couple of years. You know, sellers have been very apprehensive to come to market as a result of, you know, kind of the tightening interest rate policy and valuations, which clearly are going to be depressed in that environment. You know, our model is to look at very innovative and disruptive businesses, the type of companies that we want to own. They need to be able to demonstrate that they can outgrow their core markets by two, three, four, five times, you know, of growth rate. So a four or five percent growing market, you know, we need to see 10 to 15 percent, you know, growth capability and that kind of share gains that come along with it. Unfortunately, those type of businesses have not been trading given some of the valuation concerns. So for us, it's a little bit different as M&A activity picks up. When we find companies that fit those characteristics, that is what we go, you know, really aggressive on. And it almost is irrelevant as to the macro. And the reason is because these companies can take such share that we're able to, you know, kind of fight through macro headwinds. And then when tailwinds emerge, you know, it's really uh, a great companies to own. So, you know, we're a little agnostic to the macro mm. if we find the right opportunities, but the market has been really moribund over the last couple of years. So slim pickings, to put it mildly. And on the other end, I'm curious what that process looks like. How often do you exit a holding? 
Yeah, so our average is about seven and a half years mathematically. Um, we really differentiate from the traditional private equity structure who competes for these type of assets by holding these companies for a much longer hold period. Um, you know, we are experiencing the same thing, Katie. We did transact on a company Marucci uh, during the middle of, in 2023, um, early on. You know, that was a great asset that we owned. I'm sorry, is at the end of 23. Um, and so there are selective opportunities to be able to divest businesses, but broadly we're also seeing the weakening M&A market because of interest rates <laughs> and without pressure to have to sell any of our assets, you know, we've been more in a pause mode. I think as rates come down, hmm. it's gonna present a much better opportunity for these markets to unthaw. Right. Elias, I want to just put a pin in something that you had just said about the private equity market, though, because it is a competition that you're facing that is worth addressing. There's record amounts of dry powder and the middle market yep. becoming even more attractive. How does that complicate your hunt for deals? Yeah, so no, it's, you know, it creates more demand for these assets. And so when, and, you know, the time that we're coming in, and I said, yeah, it's really favorable because interest rate declines are gonna be great for our earnings. It's gonna be great for the value of the assets that we own, but our peers are also gonna benefit in the private equity market from more access to debt capital, reduced cost of that capital, and they're sitting on record piles of capital. So I would fully anticipate that the new acquisition market becomes frothy again with this backdrop, provided that growth concerns don't you know, turn into a recession. Um, and that the competition for assets is going to really pick up and prices are going to be significantly higher than what we've seen over the last few years. Mm. And I'm sad to say we only have about a minute left, but I do want to talk about structures here for a second. Again, coming back to that uh, Berkshire Hathaway example, of course, Bill Ackman had uh, withdrawn his IPO for a closed end fund. The FT is reporting, of course, that he might revive that. But ahead of that withdrawal, he has touted it as uh, basically Berkshire being a model for the closed end fund, trying to do a similar thing. So you think about, of course, a closed end fund structure, and then you think about the structure that you have as a holding company. What do you see as the advantages of what you do versus, say, a closed end fund? Yeah, so it's really in the types of companies that we're buying, Katie. You know, we're buying these smaller middle market companies controlling interest, and our model is to own them and to help them um, to become better companies. And that could be through management additions, it can be through systems, processes. So we consider ourselves more strategically active owners. You know, if you think about a Berkshire Hathaway or a Pershing Square, they are more dabbling in public stocks where they're gonna be less influential in the day-to-day -day activities of those companies. So, you know, they're much larger companies that they're buying. They're really like portfolio managers in a lot of cases. Our model is much more active, hands-on, smaller companies that, you know, the normal public investor would not be able to gain access to because these are 20, 30, $40 million EBITDA companies when we buy them. And our goal is to turn them into $100 million plus EBITDA companies. Um, but they're just too small for the typical investor to gain access to unless they are coming through us, right. where these other structures are essentially public companies that are being purchased. All right. Sadly, we have to leave it there. Fascinating conversation. Hope to have you back again soon. Our thanks, of course, to Elias Sabo of Compass Diversified. Meanwhile, I take a quick look at these markets right now. The S&P 500 hanging on to and building upon those gains up six tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100 about one percent higher right now and all quiet in the bond market. Ten year yields pretty much unchanged. Now, coming up, one of the most memorable conversations this year from Wall Street Week. Centerview co-founder Blair Efron on private equities comeback next. This is Bloomberg. As summer draws to a close, Wall Street Week is looking back at the first half of 2024 and forward to what the rest of the year holds for investors. In January, David Weston sat down with Centerview co-founder Blair Efron. Here's what he had to say about deal-making, talent management, and the growth of AI. I think private equity will be a very strong driver in 2024. 
if you uh, think about the years that preceding 2023, it was basically 40% of the market. Uh, there is such a uh, large group of companies that are looking for liquidity and uh, coming from private equity that I do think it'll be um, a very active time. And again, that goes directly to the financing markets as well. The financing arena will be uh, uh, more liquid than it was last year. And um, we're seeing most of the private equity uh, world uh, think about being more active. And frankly, to their credit, um, they slowed down activity at a moment when they should. They're, you know, it's uh, so um, w last year it was much easier for a corporate to look at something and not think they had private equity competition. This year, when we see companies we're selling, uh, the interest is both corporate, we're already saying it, corporate and, and private equity. How much of your business in merchant acquisition is driven by essentially the need to reform parts of a sector? I mean, I'm thinking of one that I come out of media right now. There's a lot of pressure right now for some of the big media companies to really think about the cards they've got and how they deal them and how they get rid of some, how they pick some up. How much of M&A is really driven by these big companies saying, you know, we got to really restructure? Today, I think it's most of it. Transformation is happening so quickly and is so disruptive that every company is saying, here's my portfolio today, but where's it going to be tomorrow? So even when you talk about your world, media, it used to be traditional media with three networks. Now it's <clears throat> traditional and non-traditional players. Apple, Google, Amazon are as active as Disney, Comcast, Paramount. Um, gaming, what is you know, technology? It all becomes one industry. If I go across any industry, that is... Um, uh, what we see. I look at the pharma world. The fact is, uh, life sciences is one of the biggest areas out there. Why? Because we have such innovation going on in this country. Um, so many companies you never heard of five years ago and never heard of that have become really important just uh, five years later, uh, that this becomes a window when you think about R&D for a big pharma company. It's more interesting in many ways to buy than, than build. Um, so I would say that uh, every business is being challenged in ways it never was before. And it's causing CEOs, it's causing boards, it's causing season leaders to constantly rethink their ideal portfolio, recognizing there is never an end state portfolio anymore. It is always going to be evolving. And um, the good news is we have a, um, as talented and experienced a group of leaders as ever. So when a CEO undertakes M&A today, uh, uh, chances are strong that he or she is going to end up doing a good job and the right thing for the company, both strategically and financially. All of which supports your view that 2024 looks like it'll be a lot stronger than 2023 in merchant acquisitions. What does that say for a set of you partners? Are you hiring? And if they are, you are hiring, what sorts of people you are hiring? Because it looks very different than it did certainly 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, because of some innovation. Not to speak of, for example, generative AI. Boy, that's a great question. First of all, we are hiring. So anybody has a resume, let us know. We're always hiring. Um, the skill set we look for is... Um, probably different than you would think. We want people who can think critically, who can analyze situations, who have judgment, um, have an ability to make difficult problems distilled into some more simple problems. And it's less about whether you can uh, make a great model. I do think when AI uh, over time will replace some of the skill sets that we see traditionally done in STEM, you know, coding for example. I'm not sure that uh, if I was, uh, I'd be advising my kids that uh, learning how to be great coders is going to matter in 10 years. What will matter is do you have judgment? Uh, do you have an ability to think critically, as I mentioned? Um, and ask questions that uh, need to be asked, that uh, you can see situations of what am I missing? And I think that that is a skill set um, that uh, people are going to find is increasingly important. And you also have the skill set that says, I'm going to have three careers. What do I need to know? to have three careers over my, over my professional span. And that was Centerview Partners co-founder Blair Efron speaking with David Weston back in January. And he's an interesting man, Shanali. He is a very interesting man. It's fascinating. This part of the year, yes, it's months left to go, but you have Centerview actually beating out Bank of America in terms of M&A league tables right now. Blair Efron is known to be an advisor to large corporations, but his commentary here on private equity really coming back is critical to this M&A revival. There's something else about him, too, that I think we need 
to notice, and that's his closeness to the presidential election, the Kamala Harris campaign. There's a lot of rumors about how he could potentially be a critical person, potentially in her cabinet moving forward. Commerce has been thrown around. We've written about it already. But in addition to that, he actually was a large uh, supporter of her in her prior presidential run in addition to her current one. So longtime supporter. So definitely someone to keep an eye on, of course, as we count down to that presidential election. That, of course, was Blair Efron. And tune in for a special edition of Wall Street Week tonight at 6 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Well, the late Jack Bogle, father of the first index fund, famously loathed ETFs, warning that they only incentivize speculative trading among, quote, fruitcakes, nutcases, and lunatic fringe. Fast forward to 2024, and critics warned that a new generation of ETFs are being designed to do exactly that. Enter the high-octane world of single-stock ETFs, which use derivatives to lever up daily returns on a single company. Joining us to discuss this quickly growing category is Bloomberg Intelligence analyst James Safer. And James, just set the scene for us because to a lot of people who don't live and breathe ETFs, a single stock exchange traded fund sounds like an oxymoron. I mean, it, it, it kind of is an oxymoron. I mean, the benefit here is, is it really is just taking, there's a lot of things in the ETF world. They're, they're prepackaged trades. They're doing things for you that you otherwise probably could do if you took the time to do it. So in this case, sometimes it's an inverse, a single stock, inverse NVIDIA, uh, what you name it. Or sometimes it's slightly levered. So we just had the 1.75x micro strategy. So you're adding leverage. Sometimes it's inverse, sometimes it's long. It's just basically a prepackaged leverage trade on an individual stock. There's not much more to it other than that. It's just an easy way. And honestly, a lot of people like it because it's, uh, it's, it's a capital efficient way of, of doing a trade rather than actually borrowing on margin and, and different things like that. Yeah, exactly. It's cheaper than opening a margin account or getting access the traditional way. But of course, that attracts critics who say that retail investors shouldn't have access to institutional grade uh, margins. So talk us through sort of the debate here, because People say these are designed for day trading, and it seems like the data actually backs that up. Yeah, that's right. These things, a lot, one of the critics is like these things aren't being used properly. Any sort of trading data that you look at, you can kind of guess how much, like what percentage of the holdings of the fund, not holdings of the fund, but the holders of the fund are turning over. And in many cases, these funds are heavily traded. They're probably being used properly by the vast, vast majority of people using them. So there, some of these, the, the actual shares of the fund turn over every two days, 100% turnover. Um, so that means these things are being traded heavily like they're intended to. The problem is how many people are in that group that are not using them properly, don't understand what they're getting themselves into. And I can see the argument being made that, yes, maybe there should be some sort of uh, prerequisite before you're able to touch these, just like there is a pre prerequisite to get a margin account. That said, I'm all for the big tent. Allow people to use what they want to use in the ETF market. There's plenty of things out here for long-term buy and hold, and there's plenty of options out here for short-term tactical trading. James, that's a lot of turnover. So at the end of the day, what happens if you hold it for too long, and how long is too long? Yeah, I mean, realistically, you shouldn't be holding these things longer than like a day or two, maybe a couple of days if you know what you're doing. That's what they're built to do. They're going to generate the return, those leverage returns I was talking about earlier, on a daily basis. And then it resets the next day. So basically what happens, we, we have, there's something called volatility decay or leverage decay. And over the long term, if you have a 2x NVIDIA ETF, it's not going to generate the same return as a 2x NVIDIA over like a week. It's just one day and then it resets every day. And oftentimes you get nowhere near what you would expect 2x NVIDIA to provide. So really, as long as you know what you're doing, you can hold these a little bit longer and understand the position that you have. The problem becomes when there isn't enough education and people don't understand um, and you're holding these things for weeks or months and it's been extremely volatile and the, fund, the, the stock in, the, in theory could be up over that mm -hmm. time period and a 2x long ETF could be down just because of those, those, uh, the volatility I was talking about. It's kind of like the movie 50 First Dates where every day is a brand <laughs> new day, day, everything just resets. And in the minute we have left with you, I do want to talk, though, about this sort of cultural shift that's underway in the ETF industry. Because, again, to people who don't live and breathe ETFs, ETFs mean passive index tracking vehicles. And at the same time, you have these incredibly very highly active ETFs that continue to launch and are extremely built for the speculative trader here. 
Yeah, honestly, I think the two biggest things I've seen over the last year or two is is two ends of the spectrum, right? We have these complex derivative-based products, but what they're doing is they're, we, we call these buffer ETFs or structured outcome. They're exact opposite of what we're talking about here, right? They're they're basically Xanax for boomers. They, 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 they can, they're, they're taking the edge off, whereas these things on the other end that we're talking about here, these single-stock leverage ETFs, these really complex products are the exact opposite. They're almost like amphetamine. So, like, we're basically broadening out the tails here of what ETFs are able to offer um, end clients. Uh, James, we thank you so much. We're out of time. Hey, Katie, do these go short too? Yes, they do. They go short and then they go short again. And uh, it's a good way to burn yourself if you're not Rip paying your attention. Rip your face off trades. Yeah, exactly. And of course, uh, you can catch ETF IQ. Usually it's on Mondays. It's on Wednesday next week because of that Labor Day holiday. That's at noon Eastern, of course. That does it for Chanel and I for the week. And that does it for, uh, you know, the month of August. It was Quite a weird one, quite a volatile one. We'll see what September brings. But much more coverage coming up on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg.